good afternoon. Um, this is Woman at the Wheel. It's my YouTube channel. My name is Sue. And this afternoon I am cruising through northeastern Oklahoma. I've come up um, since this morning from Lufkin, Texas. I've made some pretty good progress. Um, probably come over, over 400 miles so far today or around 400 miles I would say or well between three and four anyway um, I'm getting close to interstate 44 up in the northeast corner of Oklahoma and I kind of wanted to just give you an idea what this part of the country looks like it's kind of hilly around here but it's not heavy trees like you see in southeastern Oklahoma or even down into Texas. The trees start to get sparser. I mean, we're getting pretty close to Kansas here. But it, it's still not quite as severe as Kansas. There are trees. <laughs> I kind of like running through this area. Um, in a way, and in a way I don't. There's a lot of stoplights and it's kind of congested and it takes a while to get through here. The roads are kind of crappy, in crappy condition. So there's so much heavy truck traffic, I suspect. This is a very heavy truck zone, trucking zone. And I don't know if you can tell how much we're bouncing around, but the roads are really rough. Like, embarrassingly rough. If I was the person in charge of making them nice, I'd be embarrassed. Okay, this town is Choto. Choto, Oklahoma. You can see there, Choto Moto. I guess that's a trailer park, RV park. It's like there are a lot of RV parks around here. Not surprising. This is not only a heavy trekking area, it's kind of a heavy touristy area, or at least vacationy area because of the lakes around the area. Grand Lake isn't too far from here, I think. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and get in the center lane now, run in there for a while since we're getting into the stoplights, traffic, and trucks. You can see this is a heavy trucking area, lots of trucks. This is an area that I drove through when I was in truck driving school over at Central Tech in Drumright. We had a a day trip over into this area. Came up this very road as brand new baby truck drivers and we drove up through here. Um, I think it was our first out on the road trip, first longish road trip in traffic. So it was kind of interesting, it was kind of fun. You know, something different. We were testing out our newly gotten skills handling a big rig in traffic, making turns and things. And it all went okay. We came through it unscathed. But what we did was up here on the other end of town, we stopped and had lunch. And we had lunch at a little place that's an Amish restaurant, Amish owned and Amish run. And we went in there and there were a bunch of Amish ladies and they, they waited on us and they had like a full-on Thanksgiving dinner kind of buffet style homemade bread it was really good homemade pies turkey and all the trimmings just really really good food pretty much the kind of stuff I grew up on the way my mom cooked and I, I remember sitting in there thinking I wonder what these Amish ladies are thinking about me. Here I am, a girl, well, a woman at the time, an older lady too, I was like 50-ish at the time, in here with a bunch of guys 
<laughs> driving a truck. Kind of, kind of a weird dichotomy there between, you know, my reality and their reality. And I've always wondered what they kind of thought when they saw women coming in there, because I'm sure they've seen other women truck drivers come through there. But I, I kind of wonder. I'll never know, because I probably won't stop and ask them. They didn't really speak to us. They just waited on us. I think it's their, their custom to kind of keep separate. Not really to talk too much to what they consider, you know. I don't know if they consider us outsiders, but non-Amish anyway. I don't think they spend too much time talking to people who aren't from their community. And I don't blame them. They probably have very little in common. And uh, probably don't need to be contaminated with our worldly ideas anyway, considering their, uh, their lifestyle and their religion and all that. But boy, they can cook. <laughs> that was some very good food. Very good food. So if you're ever in the area up here, um, and you get the chance to stop in at the Amish restaurant, I would suggest that you take advantage of that opportunity and do, because they will feed you, and they'll feed you well. I'm pretty sure that this restaurant is up ahead of me, so I'll point it out when we get up here. I remember it was on the far north end of Shoto. Why did I never see that before? Fabric cut outlet store. Huh. Never seen that before. I've been through here I don't know how many times. Doesn't matter. I don't have time to sew anymore anyway. And I've got enough fabric stocked up to last me probably for the rest of my natural life. I don't know if this picked up. There was an old kind of caboose over on the railroad track to the left. I don't want to jerk the phone out of the holder because it's kind of funky to get it back in there, but I hope it caught it. If you can back up and take a look, it was kind of orangish red over on the left side of the highway. Oh, we may have passed that restaurant. I'm not sure. This is prior up here. I might have missed it. Where it may be in prior, I thought it was in Choto. We'll see. The grill, an old car with a big grill, huh, okay. People have some clever advertising ideas that you can kind of see as you go cruising around. Original barbecue, huh. Not too many people there right now. I wonder if it's there. they're closed today or something. I'm always on the lookout for a good barbecue place because I love brisket. And I've been doing like, not a strict ketogenic diet, obviously, because I drink these coffees with sugar all in them. But I don't eat anything with wheat or uh, grain in it anymore, because it messes with my blood pressure. Or I think it does anyway, it seems to. And so I'm always on the lookout for a place to buy some kind of edible meat <laughs> that, you know, isn't wrapped up in a, big old bread bun or something. So I'm not real big on hamburgers unless it's hamburger we have at home because we, we buy our beef right from a beef ranch from a local guy. We started doing that this year. Um, I was raised on 
the beef that we raised ourselves. So we, we knew what went into it. And of course, once the farm was sold and we didn't raise many more, then we went over to, to grocery store beef, which I've found to be lacking a lot of the time. It's just not that great a quality to me. And uh, so we, we found a good source for locally raised beef and bought a half of beef. And the hamburger from that is really good. Really good hamburger. The stuff at the, at the uh, fast food store is not so much, in my opinion, to my taste. I'm not fond of it. So the whole idea of just buying a hamburger and taking off the bread doesn't really do much for me because I don't like the meat to start with. Um, so I'm always looking for something else, an alternative, where I'd still you know, get the nutritional value of the protein but not have to eat a uh, hamburger that I'm not thrilled about. And I'm not even sure where they get their hamburger, to tell you the truth, for a lot of these fast food joints. I don't know if they local source it or if they freeze it in Mexico and send it up here. I mean, I just don't know. I have no idea. And that's part of the problem I have with it. I, I don't know. They don't tell you. And, I mean, I, I like knowing where my food comes from, at least in general terms. You know, is it from this country anyway? with our particular, you know, laws about food quality and cleanliness and all that, or, you know, but anyway, this is, doesn't matter now because we've got, you know, the half beef and that's really, it's been very good, very good. We ate a lot of steaks at first. We ate most of the steaks up actually because I was doing this, you know, keto, more keto type deal. So we ate a lot of steaks, and I think we're just about out of the steaks. We're down to the um, cube steaks, the ones you make chicken fry out of, chicken fried steak. And I'm not so big on those because they're kind of tough and grisly. It's just a different cut, you know, of steak, but they tenderize them, and that helps a little, but it's still kind of, I don't know. I like tender steak. I'm really spoiled to steak anyway like roast beef, like things like that. I eat other kinds of meat. I like chicken, I like some types of fish. I don't eat a lot of fish because, um, well, we're landlocked inland and it's hard to get decent fresh fish if you're talking ocean fish type of thing. Um, one of the things that I missed that was available a lot when I was a kid, which you, I haven't seen it in years on the menu at a restaurant, they used to sell halibut steaks in restaurants and that was really good fish. It was like this purest white looking flaky fish and it just had a real mild flavor. It didn't taste fishy and nasty or anything. Like to me, salmon is so greasy and fishy. I can't even, uh, just the smell of it. I, I, no way, I can't eat that stuff. Um, although I did have salmon once when I was a kid when we went out to Oregon visiting my grandpa's brother he had a fresh caught salmon and it was a completely different thing. So if it's fresh, evidently it doesn't have that fishy and nasty wang to it. But if it's not fresh, then it's a different story. So, and since I can't get it fresh, I don't eat it. I'm not going down that road again. Ugh. <laughs> so I'm kind of finicky about certain things. I will eat tuna. Um, love turkey. I love to roast a turkey. It's one of my favorite things. Um, I'll eat ham, of course. Bacon. I love bacon. I don't have any religious um, objections to, to eating pork, so. Although I know a lot of the world does. I feel for them, you know, that they can't have a nice crispy piece of bacon, but to each their own, I would say. So these roads are atrocious through here, really bad. You have to be careful going through here. You break an axle in some of these holes. So they need to do some repair work, but I also dread it 
if they ever start working on it in here because it's going to tie things up really bad. There's a big hole there I need to miss. certain stretches of road that when you're in a one ton or a bigger truck it'll just beat the hell out of you especially if you don't have um, an air suspension system to give you a little bit extra cushion and I don't I've just got the regular standard stock suspension on this truck don't have any airbags or anything so I get on some some stretches of road and it just beats the hell out of me I have to hold everything down so it doesn't flop around you know it's like uh, at, at times it's actually painful, you know, just bouncing along so hard. Fortunately, those places are not, um, they're kind of few and far between, thank goodness. I complain about them when I'm crossing them, though. I definitely do. speed I don't have to get over. Lots of farm implements out there. Looks like a county or state shop maybe. I like this country when it opens up like this. I prefer less trees. I like trees, don't get me wrong, but I like to be able to see the ground and not just trees. So I really appreciate this kind of a landscape more than um, where we were down in Texas and even southeastern Oklahoma where it's just about all trees. I even like Kansas. I mean, you know, I like open ground but I think that's probably because I was raised out west for the most part. And it's pretty open out there unless you're actually up in a forest. Now over to your right here, there's a bunch of greenhouses. That's a pot farm, believe it or not. It's got the required fence up around it. It's not much of a fence. It looks like it barely meets the requirement, but it does have a fence. That's, that's what we've got now in Oklahoma. We've got a bunch of pot farms. Um, since they, they legalized it. It's gotten to be a big industry, but it's also gotten to be a big problem because we've got Chinese foreign nationals coming in, and I kid you not, it sounds like something out of a weird, you know, made-up novel. But we get these Chinese foreign nationals coming in, and they smuggle in their Chinese buddies across the southern border and bring them up here, and they install them in these giant pot farms in places like Marlow, little bitty towns in, uh, out in the country, and they throw up a fence around them, and then they, they go in there and they live there, so it's pretty filthy conditions, but they're raising this marijuana under the guise of having a, an Oklahoma marijuana license, and then they load it up and sell it out of state. They're not following the rules. Well, they've, they've figured out what they're doing. The um, agency that governs that stuff has figured out what's going on. So they started busting a lot of these operations and you know, tearing them down, arresting the people and um, booting some of them out of the country, I think, I hope. But it's, it's weird because when it first started, uh, we had an influx of Californians, of course, because those are the people in the in that industry who've been doing it the longest. So that was kind of expected. But up here around Tulsa, especially, they came in in droves. Well, they're trying to change the politics up here in Tulsa because Tulsa has a high population, so they have a lot of power in the state. So they're trying to get in here and do a lot of activist stuff and turn Oklahoma into a... Democrat voting state. So there's a lot of stuff that that, that 
pot bill brought along with it that was unintended consequences. And those are just two of them. So that was kind of interesting. Um, when they, they first started, I thought it was a good idea, actually, um, for, for people to have like a, a retirement career or whatever, growing the stuff, if they wanted to do that. Because they made the licenses cheap enough that your average person like you or I could afford to get a license and do it. Well, that was okay for a year or two, and then they started um, putting a lot of restrictions on it because when they first started, there were no rules. It was like the Wild West, and everybody was just doing their own thing. And they, our lawmakers decided pretty quickly that they needed to put the kibosh on a bunch of this stuff that was going on. So they started making uh, rules that were pretty restrictive. So the people who had started out in the business and were doing okay, all of a sudden um, it killed a bunch of their businesses because they changed the rules midstream. So what they had been doing before, they couldn't continue doing. So they lost their customers and you know went bust. <coughs> so it's, it's just one of those things. It's, the industry's got growing pains still. I mean, it's been around now for what, five or six years. And they're still making changes every year to the, to the legislation, the laws governing it. Um, to the agencies governing it, they keep changing stuff around. I, I quit trying to keep track of it. I mean, I just know they're, they're still tinkering with it. Who knows when they'll get it set up the way they want it. But I know a lot of the people that started out in the industry are out of it now permanently, and they, they won't go back in. Um, because it's just too much of a pain in the butt trying to keep up with the ever-changing rules that, you know, one day something's legal and the next day it's not and it can it may, either makes you or breaks you so it's not a good investment um, in that sense until they solidify all this stuff and pretty much get it written in stone once they quit tinkering with it I think it'll be okay um, I don't think that the people who left it will go back into it though because of the trust factor has been lost um, a lot of people put a lot of money into it um, like their savings, a lot of older people especially, thinking, oh, well, you know, I can have a little grow here in my, I'm put a little greenhouse out here on my little acreage and make some money with some supplemental income. Well, then they legislated it, legislated it to the point where you can't do that anymore. And I think the big problem for the legislation was the fact that the big California companies came in. They weren't supposed to, but they did. They got in. Um, I don't know what they did if they bought off people and had Oklahomans buying the licenses because you weren't supposed to be able to get a license if you weren't a resident. So I don't know if they've got like um, phony licenses or, you know, phony Oklahomans. Well, I wanted to say that. They've got people um, buying licenses for them who are Oklahomans for money that aren't really in the business. So they got in, and then they started using their, their California dope money to influence our legislature to change the rules and make it more restrictive so that it's harder for the mom and pop type of business to survive. And they killed off pretty much all of their competition doing that in the first couple of years. So <clears throat> it was a, an interesting process to see how it evolved. But it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths um, between the Californians that managed to get in and destroyed the Oklahoma program for Oklahomans and the government officials that we have here who allowed that to happen after um, ostensibly setting it up so that it would be an industry encouraging Oklahomans to participate and giving Oklahomans a chance to um, get into some business ventures that would give them some decent income. Because there's, I mean, jobs around here, there are a lot of jobs in Oklahoma, but there are not a lot of good paying jobs in Oklahoma in certain areas. And those are the areas, rural areas, where people were trying to get into this to, you know, get some better income. And they, they really screwed everybody over is what they did in plain language. So just kind of interesting that, that seeing that one, <laughs> one pot farm set me off on that whole tangent. But it, it's something that I think about, you know, when I'm driving around, I see things like that, and then that, that's kind of how I think. It triggers something else, not triggers like in a woke, triggering way, but it, it um, gives me some other um, 
it makes me think about something else in a similar context and then takes me off on another tangent like that. So anyway, I think that's kind of interesting as far as the progression of that. And it, it's interesting to have watched it all happen. So now I'm, I have no interest in it anymore, really, except for, historically speaking, I observed all that. At this point, um, I mean, I'm just not, not that interested in the, the whole deal. <laughs> I don't have any reason to be. I'm out here busy hauling trailers around. That was an exciting segue, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, I'm getting close to Interstate 44. I think I'm going to cut this off for now, and then I'll pick it back up up in Missouri and we'll see what's going on up there and in the meantime um, I'm just going to try and mind my mind what I'm doing and pay attention because it's going to get congested up at the, the uh, interstate I guess I'll talk to you next time thank you for riding with me